how many times can you go through rehab and detox only to end up back on the streets? And how many times can a person hit rock bottom but still rise up again? For Patty Schimmel, one of the all-time great female drummers, the answer is always. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Patty, through her friendship with Kurt Cobain and his wife, Courtney Love, becomes the drummer for the renowned rock group, Hole. And in her memoir, Hit So Hard, you will see the remarkable strength of the human spirit. <laughs> As I, I told my family, I said, what we're about to experience is someone who has written, well, it's called Hit So Hard. It's the name of the book, and it hit me so hard. I have never felt this way after finishing a book like this. I've never felt the actual pain that you write here, and then the pleasure of your survival, and I just so welcome you to the show. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the kind words of uh, the book. It's my pleasure. It's, the, it's, it's truer than true. I'm going to let my audience know this, and they'll hear. You open even the words, I was born recovering. Yeah. That was, recovery was the language of my house growing up. Both parents were in uh, AA, and that's how they met, was in a meeting in Brooklyn, New York. And so that was sort of the, the way, that was sort of our, our spiritual our spirituality in my family was sort of the, the 12 steps. So I was familiar with the language and with um, how y there were meetings in our kitchen and there were um, y there were uh, people, you know, coming in that needed help uh, with getting clean and sober into our house. And so that was sort of the, the impetus. The beginning of, of my book was, yeah, I was born recovering, and that's how it began. And that's what makes it so amazing, because through the book, I have never experienced a person hit rock bottom from all forms of addiction and then bounce back up and be the way you describe it. I kept saying, it's got to happen now, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's got to happen now and it doesn't. It's got to happen, and it doesn't. So I was telling my son, and he agreed when he read it, he said, this is truly the ultimate story of the human being's resilience. Mm. That's, uh, it, for me, the, the, con the continuous uh, in and out of being clean and sober and up and down in the, cr the, the grind of that life. and. Um, was what I wanted to to really put down on on the page that it wasn't uh, I did not want to glamorize uh, that my addiction and, and heroin addiction and you know they, they say that heroin chic of the 90s and um, I was as I said born recovering I was born an addict I was born with the disease of alcoholism and when I I growing up felt awkward in my body and different, first of all, because I was gay. Second of all, just uh, not feeling comfortable inside my spirit. So at 11, I discovered drums. Drums put me physically into my body by the act of hitting and playing. I felt some relief. And then at 12, discovering having my first drink, did the same thing. Finally, I felt I'd arrived inside myself. And that was what I was searching for, was that, uh, that comfort. And that's what alcohol had given me, was that sort of comfortable, OK, I can have an out breath now. I'm OK in the world. I can move and operate, and I'm OK. And the irony to me was when you say, the alcohol, the heroin, all of that was easier for people to take than you being gay. That was one of the toughest things for me to read because we, 
thank God times are so different now. I'm not saying they're perfect, yeah. but at that time, when we're still only talking the 90s, we're not talking ancient right. history here, right. that was still more taboo in a certain way within a certain culture than all of the destructive addiction. Yeah, and I wanted, I would have rather people thought I was an alcoholic than a gay woman, you know, a gay person. That was uh, so scary to me at the time. Well, discovering the music and the drum in particular, I, I had John Densmore on my show from The Doors, one of the great drummers of all time as well. And as I announced in the beginning, I believe you are one of the great female drummers. When we hear the beats, and, and I am going to play one of your songs at the end of the show, one of your new songs. But yep. when you were with Courtney Love and, and Hole, which mm -hmm. is what brought the fame and attention to your drumming, the way you describe the drumming, you really wanted to feel the pain. Mm -hmm. That was as important as feeling the beat. And as I said with John Densmore, there's something about the drum that not only penetrates your ear, but physically you feel it in your side. That's the beat. Yes. You feel it in your chakras. Yes. And that, that feeling for me was uh, being loud. As a, as a young girl, I felt small. And then sitting down at the drums, I became louder and people could hear me. And I made my presence known. And uh, going through years of playing and then arriving on a stage in front of 70,000 people and looking out at them and they are all moving to the rhythm of my right foot, which is hitting a kick drum, which is moving that many people and having that realization uh, as a performer was an amazing moment for me to realize that I went from my bedroom <laughs> to the stage to move that many people, you know? And um, I felt, so, I am so grateful that I had that opportunity and drums gave me, uh, drums gave me the opportunity and took me around the world. And, um, it became my identity, you know, and um, it gave me a, uh, a, a thing to do as a kid that kept me out of trouble, you know. But in the background voice, and this is what makes, as I, as I say, the, the, the beauty of this is you, you see the passion in the drumming, then you see the destruction in the drum, mm -hmm. then you, you are the, one of the most complex people, and it is beautiful complexion. I, I'm, I must say, but this feeling that you, this one, it hit me when you said, I needed to obliterate my self-esteem. Mm. I actually almost felt that recently, just felt it even, and it shook me to my core. Mm -hmm. the, the awkwardness of feeling uh, the self-esteem of, I, I should, uh, my, my, I should have this, or that, that awkwardness of I, I, I should or I shouldn't, you know, I deserve this, but no, I don't feel right here, you know, in, in the success of my music. If you understand what I mean is that I, I felt awkward. I had this strange sort of imbalance. Well, you know, you, you met Courtney through Kurt Cobain, who yes. seemed to have that same imbalance to a certain extent. He, he just wanted to get away from it as well. It's, mm -hmm. it's very weird when you struggle so much to be, and then you get there and then have to struggle so much not to be. Yeah, and that- It's, a, it's, it's odd, isn't well, yeah, it? I mean, it it's is, strange. And what, for me, in my thoughts, and maybe I think for Kurt too, it was um, having a dream and achieving, working, and then achieving the dream, and then you're getting there, and you're thinking, if I, you know, just had this, this, and this, I would be okay, and you're not. You get there, you achieve that dream, and you reach that goal, and then you realize, well, no, that's, I still don't feel complete. And then here we are with, you know, drug addiction, you know, then uh, I still need to keep reaching out to feel okay. And when you do, especially, and, and, and let's, uh, 
I'm going to level with everyone. It's from alcohol to heroin to meth to crack. You name it. Yeah. You've done it. Right. There does, though, also seem in a very and I want to be so careful and Patty, please set this straight. There is, though, almost this love affair mm -hmm. with this evil drug. It, there is this, you do fall in love with it. I, I did and I do because that is the, that is your, for me, it was my, the, the first thing that felt like my mother hugging me you know, or like a warm blanket and everything's okay. And so looking at um, things like, you know, abandonment issues, a lot of stuff going on in, for me. And then discovering the feeling of alcohol, the feeling of heroin, and then feeling a, a, a you know, a feeling of uh, an out breath of, of that, that hug, you know, and um, that was my, first love. It's even hard to hear because I know how painful it was to to know that that's not really love and you, yeah. you finally after so many times but there's something else that, that I think I, I think the audience needs to know this because Hole was a, a pretty famous group and you were like said you you were blessed with the fame that you walked around even though I could tell you never cared if you were famous. It was just the, be the beauty of the music that moved you. Yet, what most people don't realize is you were treated like this rock star, you lived this rock star life, yet money was never really there. And most people, outside of maybe a Kurt Cobain or a Nirvana or a, you know, uh, anybody who's so famous, a Beyonce or whatnot, they mm -hmm. don't have issues with it. But that drummer, you had financial issues all throughout life, even at the epitome of fame. Right, and it's the it's the story of the the, the drummer, the drummer. Uh, in each situation, when we're writing, and, and you don't necessarily have a get publishing. So when you know you're paid, when when a guitar player or a singer is paid for their song on the radio, the drummer you get paid for playing it, but you don't get paid for, you know, you don't get the ongoing publishing. And so for me, it was touring that paid my bills. And so we'd do a tour and then I'd get a check when I was done with that, pay my rent. And then, you know, then get caught back up in drug addiction, which then would just, you know, s suck all the, my financial security out of my life. And it was, you know, on that, Roller coaster, and I thought this was interesting. When you got, they kicked you out of Hole, and you can tell they didn't do it for any reason of the quality of your drumming. It was sort of like, and I have seen this in, by the way, not only music in any job. A new boss comes in, mm. somebody's got a friend, they want that friend to be the drummer. You create all the beats, you create everything, and they stick him there, and he then takes over right. and does your stuff. But yet when you listen to it, and, and I'll never forget this, I, I was on a train once in Europe and I met a classical pianist. And he said, I said to him, you know, as a classical pianist, you know, what's the difference between you and a Vladimir Horowitz? And I'll never forget this, he said, it's what you don't hear. And I could tell that when you heard this drummer it's what you didn't hear. You didn't hear the passion of Patty. You didn't hear that beat that hits your soul. So there's so much more to music, mm -hmm. but the devastation of that, and then knowing that, and everyone knew you were better. I don't know, how do you, again, I, I have little issues that bring me down to my knees. Right. I don't know how. And, and I was that, event and the idea of being replaced by a studio drummer was such a um i mean I, for, I was so naive that i was shocked and, and and this was a practice that happened all the time and you know it didn't have the energy of our live show it didn't have the sort of messiness and uh, uh sort of uh, unpredictability you know those performances that celebrity skin brought it brought a a very um glittery and glossy you know package and that's 
um, and some amazing songs on that record, just beautiful songwriting. And, and Eric Erlinson steps up and plays some amazing guitar parts. And, and by the way, just so that people know, even though you weren't physically doing the drumming, yeah. you wrote yes, all the drumming. I did. And I sat in the studio and I worked every single day with the producer behind the, you know, in the booth saying, do it again do it again, you know, over and over. And knowing that, you know, he's got his guy waiting to come in and, you know, he's just wearing me down each, you know, with each take. And so finally it came to the part where, you know, I wasn't going to give up and they had to like, you know, have a little meeting where they're saying, we're going to, we're going to have, you know, so-and-so. I think I referred to him as Johnny One Take in the book, <laughs> the guy that just steps in and, and just nails it. Now, this could be simply a typo. So I have to be very careful. When I read every word, uh -huh. I have to be careful. If this is a typo, just say so, and I will cut this out. Okay, okay. But when you're kicked out of whole, that's when you decide to try crack for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it was about the chase for that feeling. And the word feeling is not the beginning of a sentence, yet you capitalized the F. Is that simply a mistake, or is there something to the reason why you capitalized the F in feeling? It, there, would, there wasn't a conscious thing, but I will say that that sounds like <laughs> something that, I mean, feeling was so, in, such a major part of uh, my, you, you, my story, my drug addiction, the feeling of... That's why I thought it was done intentionally. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, maybe when I, I, I did, they, because we went over this, of course, as you do, you, you go over each page and, you know, and I did the audio version and went over extra, you know, so that I'm sure that's probably, um, it might be uh, intentional, but I don't remember saying, hey, let's keep that, but... And maybe they felt it the same way I did when I read it, because I yeah. did. I read it and I said, Oh, now I know why, Pat, because it must be all about feeling, because that's what you're, in fact, that's the yin of the yang of being an artist like you are, is the feeling is so intense in every level, it's hard to keep an equilibrium. So feeling is a dominant force of energy and life. Yes, and that trying to keep that balance and that feeling of uh, I can function and do my job. Now I said before, we, it's every ch page, every chapter, one is called end of the line. Uh -huh. And I figure, ah, oh, Patty's coming back. Because we, we know you're here, so we, yeah. you got the book there. Then the next one's called rock bottom number one. And I go, uh-oh, that tells me there must be another rock bottom. Mm -hmm. It keeps going and going to the point where I want people to know you are willingly sharing needles that you know most likely are infected. Yeah. And B, as the star of one of the biggest group, female groups in particular of the 90s, you are living on an intersection at the corner of a street outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the, all, the, the cliche of it, you have to lose everything is the story. That's what happened. And I lost everything, and that's what it took. But you lost everything a multiple <laughs> amount of yeah. times. That's yes. why I said this book is about the human spirit and resilience like never before, because each time I'm reading it, I'm saying, oh, Patty's finally coming back. Right. I go, wait, too many pages. I guess not yet. And, and I get the question, I've been asked the question, what did it take? Well, it took losing everything, but also it took I had to let go of my past self. I had to let go of the ego of being Patty Schemmel, the drummer of Hole. I had to let, and let go of uh, being the best drummer and, the, and the, let go of um, the, the sadness of being replaced on a record and accept that, you know? And that, uh, and just have a clean slate and begin again. and in the beginning again, build a new life without trying to scramble back into that scene and be with those people and be cool and, 
and be, you know, the, all those things, uh, be skinny, be uh, wear the right thing and all the stuff and uh, be with the right people that are cool. Um, I let go of it, finally let go. And what you do, and I think this is, my, my wife just loves this part because we have animals, and she says what you do is you end up being a dog groomer. Yeah. I don't even know if you still do that, by the way. I have no clue because it, I, I know that you're still making music because yes. I want to people know I'm going to play some of your new music at the end. But the animals, yeah. they helped tremendously bring you back. Mm -hmm. I, I, and when you describe it, you can see the love, especially one who, by the way, the whole story about that one is kind of funny. I don't know if we have time for it, but, <laughs> but that love, you, you now begin to feel love from a true source. Mm -hmm. And the, I was living in a sober living situation with other women, and each of these women were getting jobs. And I found a job at a dog daycare facility and that's where it began, my work with dogs. And, you know, taking the bus into work every day and showing up and, you know, just cleaning. And then slowly, you know, each day, you know, my boss saying, really good work with that dog the other day. You know, just that. And then taking that small bit of that compliment that made me feel good about myself that had nothing to do with drums, nothing to do with being in a rock band. It had to do with a, something I did that was just, I, I needed that bit of esteem. So I started to fill myself up with bits of this new life, you know, with, with uh, challenges like, you know, which things like, it's scary to talk to a, a customer at, you know, it, at a store, you know, those things. And it's scary to take the bus from the valley to Hollywood when you don't know, you know, those things were huge. And those were the little bits of esteem that I kept putting in to fill myself and rebuild. You know, I, I need to give credit to the author who said this, but I cannot remember his name. But every viewer, I need to let, these are not my words. These are a great author. It's the title of a book. Maybe you even know his name. It's called Tender Mercies. Mm. And what the line is, is you must be thankful for the tender mercies. And that seems to be what was happening to you. And getting grateful, being grateful and noticing it, you know? No, oh. Go back to that noticing it because yeah. gratefulness is such an easy word to say mm -hmm. and you could read every book about it and I think I have, but to really notice it and feel it, that leap is the ultimate leap we all need to make and I, 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 that has to be the leap that made it finally for you. And I think that not sitting in, in, in a moment of meditation and saying, Oh, I must, you know, be grateful for something at this this point. I'm gonna, you know, think in my mind what I'm grateful for and make a list. It was when an event happened to me. I would sit back and and then take it in and go. I I feel good, you know, and I can notice it, and I feel grateful, you know, that uh, whatever it was was because there's such a difference between the way it was and the way I am today. And on that note, we're, we're just about done, but the way you still are grateful you have now, your brother back in your life, who yeah. also was an addict at one time, yes. and who's back in your life, you're yeah. making music together, <laughs> and you have a, a beautiful wife, Christina, a beautiful baby girl, yeah. and I'll, here it is. My life now is about asking for help on a regular basis, and I love that line, but it's March 1st, 2005, that's your official sober birthday. And I'm very grateful for your birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to end with these words because I, I've got, I think the way you say it, you just had more chances. And I'm grateful that you did, Patty. Thank you so very much for being on our show. And thank you all for joining us. Now, before Patty leaves, 
I would like to leave you with these few more words from Hit So Hard. I want to constantly remind that person who is ashamed of themselves that it doesn't have to feel that way. And no matter what your challenge is in life, you're in good company. I'm Barry Kibrick. Always remember that between all of the shame and all of the challenges of life itself, we are in this together, and therefore, we are in good company. Thank you, Patty, so much. Thanks.